All right, thanks. So it's good to be here. I want to talk to you a little about our uh, protected culture for berries. We're working with both strawberries and raspberries and blackberries. I just want to give you a snapshot of what we're doing with all three of these. Uh, the bottom line is that the tunnels really seem to help these berry crops in, in many different ways. And I'll sort of share that with you as we go forward. I'd like to show this slide to begin with. You can see the snow over top of the tunnels, and we're still picking our fruit. Um, this is a picture of a full-fledged commercial field with low tunnels over strawberries. This could be our strawberry fields of the future, something that looks like this, because of all the advantages that these tunnels give. It's not romantic, it's not that pretty, but it does give you high yields over a very long extended season. And this comes about because of some of the qualities in the plastic that Kathy was just talking about, and also some of the newer varieties that are coming out that have lost their sensitivity to day length. So instead of just producing flowers under short days in the fall, and those flowers opening up in the spring and getting one big crop of fruit, these strawberries are insensitive to day length for the most part. They produce flowers under all sorts of day lengths as long as the temperatures aren't too hot. So it means that all summer long they can be producing flower buds and you can be picking fruit. And if you can keep them going in the fall and keep them protected, they can produce fruit uh, quite late into the fall. And this is a, a graph here of uh, yield, basically, starting at the end of August. Some of these uh, varieties, this one's Albion. These are some different plastics. Some of the ones that Kathy talked about are included here. And you can see that the production peak actually uh, maxes out here end of September, early October, as we're getting a lot of fruit, and then it starts to fall off. But we're still getting fruit here even into November. This is in Ithaca, New York. So when I left this morning, there was quite a bit of snow on the ground. From down here, it's like, it's warm. I didn't even have my jacket on. Uh, but it's pretty cold up there. Still, you know, this is a couple of years ago, November 10th, you know, in Ithaca, I'm picking lots of strawberries. And that's pretty impressive. The other thing Kathy mentioned is that uh, growing strawberries under these plastics really cuts down a lot on the diseases you might see. Some of the common ones, like botrytis, you just don't see it, gray mold. And in powdery mildew, that's sort of reduced a lot, too. So that's another advantage of having these uh, plastic covers. Uh, Kathy showed you lots of graphs like this, so I won't dwell on that, but uh, just to say that the plastics that sort of block some of the UV and also reduce some of the infrared are, seem to be the ones that work best, and they allow the visible light through. The visible light's right in here. So here's your typical setup. We have the strawberries here producing fruit. We're using white on black plastic. Kathy just said that they were having some anthracnose problems. We've not seen anthracnose yet, so uh, that's good. And then we have the tunnels over the top. In this case here, the tunnel sides are pulled up. They're not down like you saw in that earlier picture. And these are just some data uh, of planting the strawberries. These are five different varieties. Plant them in the spring. And they start fruiting that same year. You don't have to wait a whole year. They start fruiting that same year. We start picking the fruit. And what I want to do is just compare the yield under these tunnels with the yield in the open field. In almost every case, the yield in the tunnel is higher. On average, 27% higher. The other thing to notice is that the percent of the fruit that's good, that didn't have any kind of damage at all to it, it was large and so forth, was also higher in the tunnel than outside the tunnel in the open field. And again, 15% higher marketable fruit under the low tunnels. So it was pretty cool. We planted it end of May and harvested starting in August and gone all the way to the early November. Now, uh, that could be good enough. You could take the strawberries out at that point and start over again. But you can also leave them in the ground, overwinter them, and then fruit them again in the following year. They produce one really nice flush in the springtime, about the same time as your regular June berries produce. So in this case, we left them in the ground over the winter, covered them with some mulch, took the mulch off in the spring, let them fruit one more time. Again, we had both tunnels and no tunnels. And uh, we got some really big differences the following spring because the ones that were flowering early had these tunnels over them. They were protected from frost. The ones that didn't have tunnels were opening up and uh, damaged. So again, the big difference in yield from under the tunnel to not under the tunnel in each case. 
And the same way, percent good berries is much higher under the tunnel than not under the tunnel. And at that point, after that spring flush, we find it's not economical to keep them going, so we take them out. But we've also already planted some other strawberries that spring. So by the time we get that second year's crop, and those are out, the new ones we just planted are getting ready to start to produce fruit. So essentially, we're getting strawberries from early June all the way through to early November by planting once and growing these things for one full year and a little bit more than that, so maybe 14 months in the ground. We were interested in knowing what time we should plant these. Like, it's a lot of work to get out there really early in the spring and get plants in the ground, especially if you haven't had the soil worked up. So we were interested in how long can we wait uh, to plant these things to get a decent crop that year. So we looked at four different planting dates from end of April up until middle of June. Uh, some years we can get on before early April or before late April, sometimes 15th of April, but that's kind of pushing it for us. We looked at these four planting dates, two varieties, and then we just harvested the fruit that year to see what planting date was most important. So you can see here's, the, it, probably this was t taken, I would say probably in June. So you can see strawberries at different stages. Some were planted, this was probably late June, some were planted you know, just a couple weeks earlier, and some were planted way back at the end of April. You can see the different sizes, and you can see the hoops here, and then we put the plastic over these hoops and then harvest the fruit. That's what it looks like. Typically, what we do is we don't keep those things completely covered all the time. We just keep one side down and leave the other side open because we want bees to get in and things like that. And if we keep the side down, that's sort of facing the south, the sun, or the west, like in the evening, because it has an infrared blocking, it kind of keeps the plants a little bit cooler. And then if it rains, we want to close those tunnels up, we just have to go along one side and pull them down instead of going to both sides. So it cuts your work in half when it comes time to pull those tunnels down when it's going to rain, and then pull it back up again. So just a few pictures, quite a bit of fruit late in the season, plants look really nice. I mean, this is September. And then this is our yields based on planting date. So here we can see the 30th of April, 15th of May, late May, mid-June, and planting date kind of goes down, showing that the earlier you plant, the little bit better. That was for Albion. We got the same results for Seascape. Essentially, the earlier you can get out there, the better it is for that first year. It's not surprising, they have a longer time to grow. Uh, we repeated the experiment at Geneva, same thing, early planting dates better. If you wait until you know, middle of June to plant your strawberries, they don't do as well. So get them on the ground as soon as you can in the spring for the best results. The other thing we weren't real sure about is how to fertilize these things because with typical strawberries, you need to plant them, put a little bit of fertilizer on, wait a few weeks, put some more on, and maybe put some on in the fall, then the next year, so they produce their crop, and then you fertilize. Well, these are producing f continuously, so when do you fertilize? So the answer seems to be you have to spoon feed them. Like every week, you have to give them a little bit of fertilizer. We weren't sure exactly how much that is. We're thinking it's somewhere between, you know, three and five pounds of actual nitrogen per week per acre. But we're trying to fine-tune that and get some uh, good information on that. When we did grower trials, um, when the grower trials didn't work very well were when the growers were not giving them nitrogen every week. They really need to be spoon fed. They have shallow roots. They're not very efficient at taking up nitrogen, so you've got to spoon feed them. So that's what this experiment is. We're doing another experiment this year. We take out the grower farms, have them try it, try to get the word around, get them to try this and see if they like it. Uh, this grower here, she says, sent me an email just a little while ago, good morning, had a wonderful year, utilizing the low tunnel system. Uh, now she's uh, bought enough for 5,000 row feet. She's really happy with it. So it's not for everyone, but it works pretty well. And I think that when it's not for everyone, it's for people that don't have the time to manage a crop that's going to give you fruit like twice a week, all summer long into the fall. And once in a while, you have to lower the sides of the tunnel. So it's a lot of kind of extra work on top of everything else you're doing. 
But if you're sort of have an opportunity to, I have a little bit of extra time and I want to invest in something, this can be pretty cool. Wegmans has been out looking at our stuff. They're really interested in getting local growers to grow these things for their stores so they don't have to ship things in from the West Coast. We have field days and everything for people to see it. So we're pretty excited about this system. We're going to be doing a lot more work this year on it. Uh, this is one of our grower farms in eastern New York, up near Albany. And again, he just took yield on under the tunnel and outside the tunnel. You know, big differences. You consistently see the differences. The economics look pretty favorable. I don't want to go through this in detail because I got some other stuff I'm going to tell you about. But the income, we're getting about 20,000 pounds per acre of yield that first year. And at $4 a pound, it's a pretty high price. Maybe not for here. For us, it's a little bit high, but this fruit's coming in in August, September, and October when there's no other strawberries. So we get a pretty high price. You can you know, gross $80,000 per acre. Pretty good. And you subtract out your costs, you know, you're left with a good bit of money. And remember, at that point, you've already paid for your tunnel materials. So in future years, you don't have to buy that again. Just make sure that those hoops are already purchased and they'll last forever. The second year, if you hold those through the winter and fruit them again the second year, you don't have to buy new tunnel materials again. Everything's in place. No, the plants are there. Beds are there, everything like that. And again, a pretty good revenue per acre. And in the year you don't have to buy tunnels, after you've done it a couple of years, you have to buy the tunnels again. It's really good. Anyway, these are some rough numbers. I'm sure every grower has additional costs than what's up here. But just comparing, trying to apples to apples to apples, it looks, the pencil's out very positively. And I mentioned that sometimes growers are complaining, oh, I like it, but it's difficult to fit in because I'm so busy doing all these other things, I can't pay attention. So there's strawberries, I can't give them fertilizer every week, I can't get out there and harvest them twice a week and stuff like that. But uh, for people who don't have those constraints, it seems to work pretty well. I also want to talk a little bit about some raspberries. And uh, tunnel raspberries are now uh, the norm around the world. Almost every production region, everywhere in the world now, are growing raspberries under tunnels. It's not because they need the temperature management. It's because they want to prevent moisture from getting on the fruit. Moisture on a raspberry fruit is deadly. It, you know, it causes the mold and the fruit quality deteriorates. So growers like in California here, they're covering just to keep the dew off the plants. And it's worth it to them to do that. You know, here in the Northeast, we get dew on our plants. We get rain on our plants. We also have uh, a lot of wind in this part of the country. And we get this, we have this opportunity to extend the season late. So we have more reasons than even California for growing raspberries under tunnels, or these other parts of the world that are growing raspberries under tunnels. We have a lot of reasons for doing it. So the potential is there. So there are a few strategies you can implement to do raspberries under tunnels. One is, you were mentioning about raspberries. So you can take fall raspberry, you can plant it, you can let it grow, you can cover it in a tunnel, and then you get that fall fruit. Now for us in New York, we get a frost about the time that that fruit is about halfway harvested. So typically outdoors, we lose half our crop just because it gets cold. In the September, early October is our date of first heavy frost. The harvest isn't done yet. That fruit's still green, but it's not going to ripen anymore. But if we put a tunnel over it, that, those plants can keep going so we can get a full crop off of it. The other little trick we can do is when those primocanes are about this tall, if we pinch the tip of those primocanes, it actually slows down flowering and it pushes the crop later. Now, you don't want to do that outside, but inside a tunnel, that's an advantage. At least so you can take half your rows and not pinch them, and they'll come in at the normal time. The other half you pinch, they're going to come in a little bit later. So you can spread your crop out quite a bit under a tunnel in the fall. So that's one way to spread that out. And it doesn't uh, hurt your yields at all to pinch, as long as you have the tunnel. So here we're doing a little bit of pinching. Pinch that little growing tip. You can see the little branches starting off to the side. It delays flowering. These are pinched plants, unpinched plants. These will come in a couple of weeks earlier than these. It's a way of spreading that season out. So here we are again in Ithaca, end of October. Uh, the leaves have fallen off the trees by now. We've had two or three weeks of frosty weather. 
and we're in these tunnels picking raspberries, nice raspberries. We were a little bit concerned about pollination later in the season because, you know, the bees die when it gets cold. Well, you know, these little bumblebees here, they love that tunnel. It's nice and warm. I guess they don't want to die either, so they crawl in there. And you can just see bumblebees. These are wild bumblebees just all over the place in here. So no issues with pollination. They love it in there. And uh, we're picking nice fruit in the middle of October into November. In our climate, once in a while, we'll get some really cold nights. Like, it might get down to, like, in the low 20s. But then it warms up again for another week or so. And we found if we could just drag a row cover in there and cover up those plants in that really, really cold night, take those covers off the next day, you can keep on going for another week or so. So again, raspberries we're harvesting into November. So these are, this is a graph of various weeks. This is the end of August. So you can go on. This is September, you know, October, November. These are the various curves. This is when we normally get a frost outside. So these are the control plants, and right when they're just getting in peak, we get a frost, and we're done. But in the tunnel, we keep on going. And then if we pinch, that's what these graphs are here, the orange and the green. It shifts the production a little bit later. So we get a peak early, then we can get a peak a few weeks later. Another thing you can do is keep these raspberries, these fall raspberries, uh, going through the winter and then fruit them again early in the spring and get a double crop. And the thing is, in the tunnel, the raspberries, the, even the, the fall raspberries grow really, really tall. It's amazing. These are heritage. This is outside. And Jenny's, you know, normal height woman there and her shoulder height, normal size heritage raspberry. But in the tunnel, same heritage. These are like 10 feet away from these. They're like 14 feet tall, 10 feet tall. Yeah, you know, they're really tall. And they had to use stools to, to pick that fruit. Typically with these fall raspberries, you often just mow them down. But if you're getting fruit from this range right here, this area here, and then you mow those canes down to the ground, you're throwing away some potential yield. So the idea here is pick, pick the fruit at the tip and then allow this, this part of the raspberry to overwinter in a four season tunnel and then pick that fruit in the spring and then get that fall crop again in the fall. So it's a way of you know, producing a lot of raspberries out of your four season tunnel. And then the last thing I want to mention to you are blackberries. We have a really difficult time growing blackberries up in upstate New York. It's just too cold. And when we try to grow blackberries, almost all the time they die down to the ground. The floor canes die to the ground. The first year canes come up, or, and they're fine, but then they die in the winter. So we just don't have any luck at all. So we thought, well, what if we try to overwinter these in a tunnel? So we got our tunnel, four season tunnel, Rimmel tunnels, uh, made to withstand a snow load, um, made to withstand a lot of wind. And we have inside here, we have our blackberries. And uh, we, I'm going to show you some data in sequential years. This is an early year when we planted blackberries in the tunnel. We had an identical planting outside the tunnels and then one uh, inside the tunnel. And you compare field to tunnel on season length, on fruit size, on yield, percent marketable, triple crown, the same thing, watch it tall, the same thing. Inside, always better in terms of yield, season length, percent marketable fruit and yield. It's always better inside a tunnel. This is 2007. You can make the same comparison in 2008. Big differences inside and outside the tunnel. Outside, they're getting damaged by the cold and the wind. Inside the tunnel, it's not much warmer, but they're protected from the wind, and it's still in there, and the plants just seem to do fine. Same thing, 2010. And uh, this is our estimated pounds per hectare. Cut this in half for pounds per acre, but around 20,000 pounds of fruit per covered acre of varieties like Chester and Triple Crown. Pretty good, especially since nobody else has blackberries around. It takes about four years for these plants to be each full production. So it goes up to four years, and then from there on, you're producing. And there's some pictures from inside the tunnel, what it looks like. 
2010. Really nice fruit. Lots of fruit. So this is a cold climate. And it's just a lot of work to pick all that fruit. But it's very productive. So that's something we're excited about. Let me just go back here. There's a lot of vegetative growth in here, a lot of vigor, and it's difficult to pick because there's just so much vegetative growth. So what we're looking at now is wondering if we can't get the same yields of fewer plants that are spaced a little bit further apart and where the vegetative canes are managed a little bit more intensively. So we just don't have this great big mass of, fruit, of plant material. The plants really grow well in a tunnel because it's so warm. So here we're taking some raspberries, some first year blackberry plants, and we're taking those primocanes. Instead of letting them grow straight up like you would do outside, we're taking them and bending them and bringing them along a, a lower wire. And we're doing it all to one side. And the plants, instead of being four feet or six feet apart or eight feet apart, when those canes hit the next plant eight feet away, we pinch them. And then those throw laterals up. And then we pull those laterals all to one side of a V. So instead of having just a bunch of plants between your Vs going down the road, we have all the canes pulled over to one side of the V. Then the next year, they fruit. And all your fruits to one side. It makes it really easy to pick. Then the new canes, you're bringing up your training to the other side of the V. So you're separating the fruiting canes from the vegetative canes and uh, getting a lot less mess inside your house to deal with. So that's what we're trying to do. Training these canes instead of like this, training them like that. Uh, here you can see some of the walls of fruit. Training to one side. The new canes are going to be down on this side and this little wire when they come up. And you can see here on a V, so this is like fruiting canes, they're already done fruiting. And here's next year's canes on this side waiting to go through the winter and fruit. So it's a way of just keeping them separate, making it easy to pick. It's much easier to pick. In 2013, we had a normal winter, and that system did really well. In 2014, we had 17 nights of below zero, and we had damage to the cane so that we trained horizontally because it's such a long length of cane. We had dieback, and it really hurt that production system. The same way in 2015, 19 nights below zero. 2016, we had temperatures down around zero. Well, we had temperatures 23 centigrade below on Valentine's Day. And then we had temperatures at zero Fahrenheit on April 5th. And that really hurt us again. So we got this dieback in that, with that system. And it didn't do as well. So in a normal year, that system seems to work pretty well. But the last few winters, we've had these real erratic fluctuations in temperature. That training system that looked so good on paper uh, didn't pan out so well because we had this dieback from these extremely cold temperatures. Here's the data. First year, the conventional and the split were almost identical in terms of yield and marketable fruit. But in these two cold years, uh, the split, we lost about a third or half of our yield because we had such long canes and they died back. So, okay, so let's go back to like a normal situation where we aren't doing this system and just look at the that pencils out, cost per tunnel. Uh, I think, Dave, your, your costs are right around what our costs were, $9,000 per, per tunnel, uh, pre-plant preparation, so forth. So by the time we've all said and done with trellis and plants and irrigation, we've invested about $11,000 in our tunnel, 30 feet by 100 feet. And then production costs, we figured another $600 that year. Harvest costs, 50 cents a half pint, paying somebody. And then when we pencil it out, um, we have these expenses the first year, no sales the first year, so we're in the hole, almost $12,000. Next year, a little bit more cost, no production, in the hole even more. Second fruiting year, first fruiting year, second year in the ground, uh, some more expense, a little bit of fruit, a little bit more fruit the year after that, a little bit more fruit, and then the fifth year, or the fourth fruiting year, we're at full production. 
and we still have expenses, but we have full production and we're starting to go into the black. So it's about five years uh, with blackberries to pay yourself back. And then after that, you know, these blackberries just keep on going and going. We haven't seen any decline in vigor or anything like that. They just seem to want to keep on going. Uh, so we're up to 11 years where we're getting, you know, good production. So it looks very promising. Uh, just the last few pictures, we're using this uh, trellis growing systems trellis. It's movable. You can put them in a V and open and close the V up and so forth. Uh, and just a few pictures of some of the growers in New York and around that are growing raspberries in these tunnels. And we have information in a production guide that's available for free at this website. You can download that and get that information. So, All right, so that's what I have to say. I got one minute for questions.